mainnet's coming out. Yeah, it's uh, for real. For sure. The Polkadot platform is just scaling beautifully. We've not yet been able to like overwhelm our blockchain yet. Limits. We're processing around 4,000 transactions per block. You spot a problem, you do something about it. Imagine doing something about it. <laughs> you could just do stuff. I can't wait to do this. It's going to be so exciting. I think it was sick. The launch team wishes you good luck and Godspeed. Cheers. Nice. Space Monkeys blasting off with Shayun Lan Lege. He's the mad scientist at Polytope Labs, bringing us Hyperbridge. Shayun, welcome back to the show. It's been a bit. Honestly, it has. It has been, what, two years now? Wow, really? Time flies, doesn't it? That was such an awesome interview. I think it was Rob who said, you have to interview this guy. All and right. he gave me almost no information, uh, but he's working on something big. And that big thing ended up being Hyperbridge. Yep. And here you are about to launch Mainnet. It's insane. It's been a journey, honestly. It's also very exciting. And I think that lots of people are going to uh, enjoy what we've done so far. We've been enjoying watching you build it and trying to understand the uh, intricacies of yeah. what you're creating here. Yeah. Can you give us a um, brief overview for those who aren't familiar with what Hyperbridge is and what the promise is? So how I would describe Hyperbridge is fundamentally it's a compute platform. It's a compute platform for secure interoperability. Mm. Um, and this is important because we already have bridges, right? We have lots of bridges today. Sure. Um, but these bridges are not secured by proofs. They're secured by you know, some new validator set. Um, they're secured by some privileged actors uh, that are entirely off-chain and uh, opaque to the mm. user. Whereas with Hyperbridge, um, Hyperbridge introduces proofs and through Polkadot's highly available compute we're able to verify these proofs yeah. and then pass them along to different chains uh, for cheap. So if I'm chain A, I want to transfer tokens to chain B, I can go check what's actually happening on chain B. Exactly. I don't ask a third party and they prove it to me. No. I no, get the no. proof right from, from the source. Exactly. And then, you know, these proofs, they're very expensive, right? That's also why no one's attempted this before. Expensive like cost or it's, what do you mean? It's very expensive to verify these proofs. So we're talking about like, for instance, signatures from, you know, the, the validator set, which is like a super majority. So if you are unlucky like Ethereum and you had over a million validators, then no one would be able to bridge securely from Ethereum, mm. right? Um, but this is where Hyperbridge comes in and is then able to verify these proofs and then, you know, compress these proofs into a much cheaper proof that can then be sent to anywhere you want to go. Maybe that's BNB chain, maybe that's Polygon. You know, we just send the proofs where you need to go. And this computation, you're actually leveraging the polka dot cores. Exactly. You're turning the potential of the polka dot cores into uh, proof proving machines. Yeah, <laughs> basically, you know, I would say proof verification machines. This is what I wanted to say. Yeah. 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 You know, we have so much of it, and it's so cheap. You know, if yeah. in fact it's negatively priced, like uh, like Phil would say. Uh -huh. So. You know, we're just tapping into what is an unlimited resource, honestly. Sweet. Um, to make this happen, yeah. And you're doing this as, you know, what we've been calling parachain? You are a parachain or? So, you know, Rob said this, the, but I don't think of us as a parachain, yeah. honestly. Yeah. I think of us simply as this co-processor yeah. for um, interoperability. Um, and it's the case that, like, people will not be using the Hyperbridge blockchain directly. What's going to happen is they're going to make a transaction on some chain, some source chain, and the Hyperbridge chain will then verify that transaction and then send it where it needs to go to. So most of our users would actually be on the different connected chains and they're all using Polkadot, but they don't really know. Yeah, that's um, so sweet. And that's kind of you know what Hyperbridge does. Amazing. That's real infrastructure, right? That's like the pipes in the ground and the, exactly. the wires in the sky. It's like exactly. it's completely abstracted and um, you know it's secure at the same time as well. Um, a lot of work on our side, you know, went into researching all of the needed components to make Hyperbridge happen. We had to write a lot of libraries that didn't exist, um, libraries that are actually now being used by um, other bridging teams. Uh. I'm not going to name names, <laughs> but um, That's you know, kind of you. yeah, no, it's nice to see that um, at least the stuff that we're doing is people. Other people are finding it useful. Yeah. So the main net of Hyperbridge, it, you've been running a test net for a while. Yep. 
what do you call it, relayers have been mining tokens? Yes, they have. Uh, and uh, because people have been sending trust test transactions basically yeah. right mainnet's coming out yeah it's uh for real for sure okay uh, you know we've gone through audits and everything you know we've been on mainnet for a long time i'll be very real with you we should have actually launched way earlier but we what? had to get audits done because yeah, a few of, of our partners they wanted to see audits and everything before they could um do this official partnership with us so that kind of delayed us a bit but testnet's been going really great honestly like we recently crossed i think 400k transactions on testnet wow. and the popular platform is just scaling beautifully we've not yet been able to like overwhelm our blockchain the yet. Limits. yeah and Amazing. it's like we're processing around 4,000 transactions per block um and we still not hit the limits so wow. honestly and it's so expensive right because like you have to buy testnet tokens you know especially on ethereum they oh. actually cost something oh really okay so we're actually running out of money to test our our, our, tra <laughs> our testnet oh shoot okay it's like, okay, maybe we shouldn't. We should just let, let it happen on mainnet and yeah, see, yeah. see what happens there. Mm. But, you know, our relayers, they're itching to go to mainnet. They've already uh, been, yeah. you know, instrumental to our testnet success. Um, I want to thank everyone who's in the Polkadot ecosystem, who's also in the Cosmos ecosystem, because we have relayers from like, a very wide background. I think Polkadot and Cosmos are like the last two ecosystems that, um, that take secure interoperability very seriously. Yeah. So what's going to be possible on mainnet? You launch mainnet. I'm just an average user who wants to bring my tokens over from an Ethereum L2. What does that look like for me? Right, so you know, Hyperbridge itself is just this messaging layer. It just yeah. allows arbitrary messages to be exchanged securely. Then you now have to build applications that use this messaging. So we will also be developing a token bridge. The bridge will essentially take tokens from one chain, will custody these tokens, and then allow them to be um, minted or exchanged on the, on the destination chain yeah. um, by relayers or by market makers, whatever the case may be, allowing people to at least for the first time use Hyperbridge. But you know, for us, this token bridge is, I don't think it's going to be most of what we do. What we're going to be doing actually is working with teams, um, you know, existing applications, existing protocols, who realize that like serving a single ecosystem is maybe not you know, a good business decision and we should expand and serve more users on more chains. I see. And they want to do this securely and they want to partner with Hyperbridge to make this happen. So you have a smart contract deployed on one chain and now you're going to be able to reach users in other chains? Exactly. Easy. Exactly. Very good. Yeah. But this token swapping or what did you call it? I guess we could call it token swaps. Is there a name for this application? Yeah, it's, on, it's going through a lot of changes, so I don't want to commit to a name Yo, right cool, now. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, but it will be it will be available at launch. Um, it will be available at launch. Yes, on mainnet. On mainnet, yes. I'm going to be able to use it. Yes, you will I'm be pumped. able to use. It. You will be able to bridge dot, for instance, to yeah. all these new ecosystems. You know, I think that the dot asset um, at the moment is only useful for like staking. Yeah. Um, not a lot of lending markets in the Polkadot ecosystem, but there's already lending markets outside. So you can imagine bridging your dot somewhere else and lending dot there and that getting access to liquidity. Very nice. Yeah. So what other ecosystems TechStax is going to be available at launch right. from Polkadot? We're looking at all of the L2s, all of the OP stack based L2s, because we kind of support the OP stack in, okay. this, in general. Uh, we're looking at Ar Arbitrum. We're looking at um, the BNB chain as well, ethl one Thank nice. God for the cheap gas fees. <laughs> ETH L1 too. Yeah, yeah, ETH L1. Wow. And then we have plans to get Polygon as well. The problem is that uh, Polygon is upgrading their blockchain at the moment, so we don't want to like build something that will eventually be yeah. kind of you know irrelevant once they upgrade. So once they upgrade, we will be able to add Polygon as well. Uh, a fellow was just here before we filmed here. He was interested in bridging to Cardano. Is that possible? I think it is. I think Cardano is like one of the first POS networks. So they have very mature research into light clients and they have very mature research into like state commitments. So um, you know, once we're on mainnet, we will start exploring and uh, looking into other ecosystems that we can add while we're on mainnet. It's not going to be static. It's going to be constantly growing. Um, and we want to connect as many chains as possible. Like Polkadot provides the bandwidth to do this, so sure. let's just push it to the limit. And then what about other big chains like um, Solana or Bitcoin? Right, so Bitcoin unfortunately doesn't have this programmable environment. 
where we can tell it what to do. So in that case, you know, it would only be a one-way bridge. And I don't think that's very useful because you also want to get back your Bitcoins eventually. Yeah. So unfortunately, a, a direct to Bitcoin bridge will not be possible. Uh, we're still exploring other ways that this can happen for sure. We're not saying that it's impossible. Yeah. We're seeing opportunities with um, these new Bitcoin L2s that have you know, custody solutions for Bitcoin and they're trying to introduce this programmable layer to Bitcoin through this Bitcoin L2. So that's, I think, interesting. As for Solana, well, you know, Rob also said on the show that like Solana um, doesn't have this uh, state commitments, which are very, very needed for secure interoperability and light clients, right? So right. until Solana maybe changes and adopts a more light client friendly architecture, then it's just the case we will not be able to support Solana. How do ecosystems bridge to Solana today? What does that look like? I mean, I'd say it mostly happens through Wormhole, right? The Wormhole yeah. Guardians is, uh, I think, what they call it. Okay, yeah. so the Guardians are acting as these provers. The, yeah. They yeah. test to the state of Solana, yeah. which may or may not be accurate. You never know. You never know. You, you can't know. And when you're moving lots of money, you kind of want to know. Yeah, you want to have that guarantee. Awesome stuff. Yeah. Can you talk at all about any of these partners uh, who are going to be using this as infrastructure? For sure, for sure. I mean, there's look, there's a lot of people in the ecosystem that are now waking up to what Hyperbridge allows. Yeah. We can talk about A Star, which you know oh. they have this L2 on Ethereum, and yeah. they're now thinking, okay, how do I bridge this with my existing parachain? You know, Hyperbridge fits very nicely in there for them. That's awesome. Um, we're also looking at Polymic, for instance, and they're looking at how they might do um, multi-chain raises, right? They want to support people who want to um, fund startups from across multiple chains. Oh, that's going to be great for Polymic. You know, Open it right up. Exactly. This opens them up to a more uh, wider investor base. Uh, we're looking at Hydra DX as well, and they're looking at how they might um, bring in more liquidity and do more stuff cross-chain. So Super. this is, you know, this is exciting stuff for them. Yes. Um, and so many more. You know, there's Bifrost as well, and actually we're already working together. Yeah, so, I, I saw something yeah, funky he, happening there. Yeah. So Tyrone, who is a head of product at Bifrost, he's presenting how they're going to use Hyperbridge at this event uh, to take their LSTs multi-chain. Yeah. And it's funny because like, you know, at the last Sub-Zero, I presented ISMP and it was like this end game for multi-chain, for parachain interoperability. And it was like, uh, really, you guys are... And now there's now two teams today presenting how they're using Hyperbridge and how they're using ISMP. Um, we have Region X and we have Bifrost. Amazing stuff. And I think it's only going to just grow from there. ISMP stands for? The uh, Interoperable State Machine Protocol. And this is an alternative competitor, alternative to XEM? I mean, it's maybe maybe more um, HRMP and XEMP is what I would say. XEM is also at the application layer, and we don't enforce huh. any application layer semantics. In fact, and this is one of the things, this is one of the reasons why teams, um, they love ISMP is that like we don't, enforce any opinions on how their applications should be uh, cross-chain and who should be you know, interoperable with other uh, blockchains. Um, so you could still, if you really wanted to, do XEM over ISMP. Sure. Uh, but I don't think anyone's going to do that. I think most people are just going to like just use the bare bones API that way. We're pushing ISMP to be an alternative to XEMP. Um, it's already ready, it's already live, yeah. um, and it's already been audited as well. XCMP doesn't actually exist. It doesn't also exist, so right, this so. is a good candidate uh, for XCMP as well. Yeah, yeah. This is a way for blockchains to speak to each other, and they don't even have to be like under the same security umbrella. No, they don't. No, they don't. We've uh, created this abstract protocol that kind of generalizes blockchains, right? Yeah. Um, for interoperability, you just need finality, consensus proofs. And um, then to read the state, you then need these uh, state proofs, these Merkle proofs. Yep. And even more so is that ISMP not just allows messaging, but also allows state reads. So this is something that not a lot of people will talk about, but I believe actually, you know, it uh, unlocks more applications. And this is, what I, this is what we're talking about, right? Like, for instance, Region X, they are a core time marketplace. Yeah. And of course, it's the case that you can send core time as like an asset around chains, but then you lose information about that core time uh, metadata, like how many you know blocks is it valid for? How many cores can it be used for? This sort of stuff. Sure. Um, and then, you know, Region X, they're saying, okay, we're going to use ISMP to read 
the metadata about this core time on the core time chain. Oh, right, because are they their own parachain? Yes, they have their I own see, parachain. I see, okay. You know, this unlocks the application space, right? You can Sweet. now do more things. You can now read the state of chains and then do stuff based on that information and create new kinds of user experiences. So um, ISMP is designed not just for messaging, but also for state reads. It's fantastic stuff. Yeah. You're always coming in, looking at the landscape, seeing something wrong, and then you say, oh, hey, here's an alternative. And people think, ah, oh, sure, everybody has an idea. But then you come <laughs> and you build it and then people start using it. It's crazy. Yeah, I think that's how open decentralized ecosystems work. You just, right. you spot a problem, you do something about it. Imagine doing something about it. <laughs> it's only <laughs> some people knew. Yeah. <laughs> you could just do stuff. Like you literally could just do stuff. Yeah, well, honestly, it's, um, it's been exciting watching your journey so far. And once you go to mainnet and Right away, I'm going to be able to move stuff. We don't have to like get liquidity. Nope. I'm just able to. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I, I I can't wait to do this. It's going to be so exciting. I think it was sick. Yeah. And for all these people to be using Polkadot and not even know. I think that's kind of the next step for Polkadot is that maybe we lost out on um, user acquisition, but we can still become infrastructure for other applications in other ecosystems, and we can even do better than whatever else exists today. Honestly, it seems like our destiny. Yeah. Yeah. Shane, thanks very much for coming on the show and uh, looking always, forward to seeing what happens next. It's always a pleasure to be here, sir. Thank you for having me.